Dear ladies and gentlemen, good evening. On behalf of the organizers of the lecture series Remembering the Ottoman Past in the Eastern Mediterranean, which has been dedicated to the memory of Professor Vangelis Kechriotis, it is my pleasure to welcome you here tonight. This lecture series takes us on a journey that aims to throw light on various manifestations of remembering or approaches to the recollection of a communal past of today's residents of the Eastern Mediterranean region. After looking at textual sources in the form of self-narratives written by members of specific professions and pertaining to a particular region of the empire, we learned about the significance of photography as a means of documenting and preserving the memory of Ottoman life. Tonight's lectures continue this exploration by looking at musical references to the Ottoman past. When hearing this title, one might first think of the grandiose operas, concerts, and hymns that were inspired by Ottoman culture, which served as an inspiration for many artists in the West since at least the 17th or 18th centuries. If one takes just a cursory look at European operas, some of the best known works have an Ottoman Turkish theme. Take Mozart's The Abduction from the Serayu from 1782, or Giacomo Rossini's Il Turco in Italia from 1814. W. D. Wilson, in his study, Turks in the Operatic Stage, lists 13 operas with a Turkish theme from 1735 to 1781 alone. If we consult the short history of opera from Grout and Williams, we further learn that from 1764 to 1781, an additional 11 operas can be classified as Turkish abduction operas alone. We owe it to the works of a large number of academics and writers that we know of the particular inspiration and fascination that Western musicians found in the musical tradition and the sounds of the Ottoman realms. Much has been said and written about such turkeries in paintings and music. Aside from more aesthetical aspects that appeal to a Western audience, there was a fascination with the fresh, unknown, and exotic sounds of the East, very much in the way of Orientalism in the Saidian sense. But while the appeal that music from the Ottoman Empire had enjoyed in Europe and other parts of the world has been given a considerable amount of attention among both ethnomusicologists and historians of the Near East, much less is actually known of how the memory of a shared Ottoman past and its forms of musical expression were and are being dealt with in the successor states of the Ottoman Empire. How are elements of the Ottoman musical tradition or traditions dealt with in the national states of past World War I, Turkey and Greece? What importance is giving to and what are the repercussions of referring to such old regime traditions in the process of molding a national identity in a new state? Tonight's speakers will present a fascinating and I believe often counterintuitive portrayal of the importance and the use of memory in the field of music as part of political projects in Turkey and Greece. Our first speaker tonight is Dr. Okan Murat Öztürk, a member of the faculty of Bashkent, uh, Bashkent University State Conservatory in Ankara. He works on folk music and makam music. He has authored a variety of articles, manifestos, and book chapters about the treatment, analysis, and commentary on historical theoretical models of the traditional musical repertoire. He has both participated in and served on multiple international conventions, symposiums, panels, and seminars. At the same time, Dr. Öztürk is a practic practicing musician. In 1988, he formed the Bengi Balama Uchlüsse and worked as an artist for both TRT and the Ministry of Culture. <coughs> Pardon, excuse me. He has organized concerts, workshops, and conferences in the fields of traditional musical instruments, lute and string instruments in the Balama group. He has performed as master of ceremonies, maestro and producer in the Katre Anonym ve Eski Havala TV radio programs prepared for TRT. 2006, his book, Seybek Kulture ve Musi, was published. He authored, among other things, Pana Aman Yeminji Yilkitabe, Makam in 2012, in which direction is music heading, culture and cognitive studies in Turkey 2014, and just recently, writing the history of Ottoman music in 2015. He served as both an editor and an author for the publications Türkiye de Musikkultüre, 2008, and Kirşehirli Edvare, 
the cycles of Kirchhoff. In addition to his books, he has published dozens of his own music CDs, music for documentaries and TV program recordings. Our second speaker tonight is Professor Ioannis Selepos. He has studied history, Byzantine studies, and modern Greek philology in Hamburg, Thessalonica, Berlin, and Athens. In 2000, he earned his PhD in Eastern European history from Freie Universität Berlin. He has continuously taught since 2003 at the universities of Hamburg, Berlin, Vienna, Nicosia, Brünn, Bern, Regensburg, and Munich. In 2011, he obtained the Venia Legendi Habilitation for Southeast European History and Modern Greek Studies from the University of Vienna. He's currently professor for Modern Greek Studies at Ludwig Maximilians University in Munich, where he holds his own DFG research project since October 2015. His research interests focus on the history of modern Greece and Cyprus, nationalism and identity discourses in Southeastern Europe, modern Greek popular culture, the history of the Orthodox Church in the Ottoman Empire, and the history of the Enlightenment in Southeast Europe. Professor Selepos will speak to us on Between Lost Homeland and Orientalism, Ottoman Cities in 20th Century Greek Popular Song. But now, please join me first in welcoming our first speaker this evening, Dr. Okan Murat Öztürk, and the title he chose for tonight's lecture is From the Music of Dystopia to the Music of Utopia, the Fantasies of the Early Republican Cadres on Obsolete Music. Uh, thanks a lot, and I want to make a fast thanks uh, startup for you for the so, uh, Greek Consulate Istanbul and uh, for other organizers of this uh, event. I would like to thank all of them, and now uh, just to remembering the Ottoman passed in the Eastern Mediterranean, Mediterranean, Mediterranean Conference series will contribute to our uh, knowledge bases a lot. And my subject, which I'm going to try to explain, is that it's a very important conversion, conversion uh, phase for the Ottoman history. Why? I have used dystopia and utopia as a terminology because until today, regarding the modernization of the music, there have been written many different things by different authors and researchers, but many of them, they have evaluated the issue on one dimension and they have remitted, repeated all the time all uh, the same things. And today, I will be speaking about some uh, other dimensions of this issue and I will be talking about the ideological plan uh, of this uh, issue. And while doing this and during my presentation, I will, uh, I want to express to you that I'm, I have some thesis before starting this. And this, uh, these are the key uh, thoughts of my presentation that you can see on the screen. And in the world of uh, Ottoman world, there has been a, a movement of young young people. They they were called Young Turks, and this group, this understanding maybe, and this uh, as a whole conception, let's say, they had an utopia, and the founders of uh, of that movement, uh, was one of them was. Doctor, Dr. Abdullah Cevdet, and also was the founder of Ita Teraki. And he was saying, and he was speaking like this, and I will be speaking very briefly on this, but these are very important for the next phases of my presentation. And he says that it's, uh, so we need in this project of civilization, we need not the right thing, but what is useful for us? This is very important for us. And he says, there is no other civilization. And this civilization is European civilization. And he's expressing his thought very clearly. And he is, he is a pioneer of this movement, Mr. Dr. Abdullah Cevdet. 
and even the founder of the Republic, Mustafa Kemal Atatürk, uh, he, he is influenced by his thoughts in a great extent. And the second one, uh, regarding the development of the process, especially in the in the period of the Republican uh, period, is the expression of Mustafa Kemal Atatürk during his interview with a reporter, and the reporters asked him about the development, developments on the area of music, and he is responding, and how long did it take uh, this uh, period in Europe? And the reporter's answers for hundreds of years. And the Atatürk responds him and tells him that we don't have so much time, we cannot wait so long, and that's why uh, we are adopting the Western uh, music world. And this is uh, the concept of not having time and just to get the utility, just to be utilitarian uh, approach is even reflected by the uh, highest pers personalities of that period. And also Ahmed Hamdi Tambinar also expressed in uh, in his institute called Saatere Ayalama, and so he says that especially after the arrival of the American, this institute is now functional, and this institute completed his function. He, he speaks through his uh, his uh, person talking in his novel. And also we have the uh, Utopia, Thomas Moore, French Bacon, and Thomas Campanella. Uh, they are the key text for understanding this Utopia uh, matter. And this in the book of Francis Bacon, the, in this Utopia land, in the, he's talking about the ideal regime, ideal administration. There are some houses over there. There are houses on science, on art, on health, etc. And Bacon tells that I I have quoted here because it is very meaningful on on ideology, and he tells that we have a house in order to manage the the sensations of people, and in that house we are uh, to, we are teaching to the students all kind of tricks, and so we can direct this perception of people, sensations of people, uh, until the end of the time. So this here is the team, main team, is to change the civilization. So the within the Ottoman uh, civilization, there was some discomfort of feeling oriental. Also, in the Ottoman uh, emperorship also, there, uh, there is this kind of discomfort regarding the civilization. And so they all the time think the world they live in just like uh, hell, but to think about the Europe as a place from heaven. And even this is still is valid for today. So three days ago I spoke, I spoke with my big brother and I went to Belgium and he they told me that the Belgium uh, is a wonderful place. It's, just, it's a place just like a paradise. So uh, this is the team, and there is a uh, there are Hawas people, intellectual people in Ottoman uh, society, and now from this uh, Hawas, now we uh, they wanted to. Uh, convert to modern Turks, uh, Western Turks, and now in this project for changing the modification of the civilization, uh, there are some utopic groups uh, that are working for on this project on the change of the uh, civilization concept, and so these are there's a certain group of people in the late Ottoman and early Republican uh, process. And they have been in war at war against the 
music uh, that is peculiar to the uh, to the Havas of the old all the previous uh, civilization so they want to f uh, forget and they want to object against the Ottoman past and they 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 refuse that kind of past and I think my presentation will be uh, will be important from this point of view and this group creates a concept of creating of a notional music but there are two parts of uh, this new concept so this music will be international but in the same time it will be national and the formulation for that and then the Agio Cup also has a manifesto on that and so even uh, so there are some uh, premises of this and the so international internationality is a technique is a harmony and but the national essence is the uh, is the uh, national music so there is a there's a feeling of the music of the public so and then much more important than that and i will also mention about the agriculture with my presentation but the essence is that so with the eastern is against to eastern identity is a new modern international real music is a western uh, music it's a new music they were they were planning and this utopia is to dream of a new world a new world order just to dream of it it's a utopia and there are design the, there are designs of that and this exists since the times of the ancients and if the people are not happy with the environment in which they are living they uh, they uh, they uh, they think this is uh, of this utopia and they feel the environment in which they live in as a dystopia as a hell and now and they uh, they want to remove all these wrong things and they want to create a par paradise and what what is important here the utopists uh, and there's always difference what they say and what they do and because there's a promise but how to realize it all the time this is not certain so the way it is realized and it can be uh, really be discussed and for uh, the result Karl Popper in his uh, book called Tari Sijirin Sefaleti they call that uh, the ones that are promising to us uh, paradise on earth uh, are the ones that, that that have created nothing but an inferno on in the world why because all the all the uh, all their actions the so and uh, this kind of utopists initiated initiative has been dealt by every politician every politic science person and proper as a at the point of uh, start he expresses that utop utopist initiated uh, that the groups a uh, psychology for the groups that are not happy with the environment in which they are living uh, is uh, a minority uh, and so it's a method that is possible to create a dictatorships uh, which is uh, which is needed with the administration of a small minority group and this is a very meaningful thing on the basis of authoritarian approaches so in the antique uh, Greek ancient Greek language so utopia is a place uh, is a beautiful place but not present in the world and the dystopia concept is also important we know that concept through science fiction novels and also we have uh, Al, Al, uh, of Huxley and George Orwell 
uh, they have uh, given some examples of dystopia. It's a uh, authoritarian regimes, uh, novels, and movies that you see. And dystopia is a reality, and I give too much importance to this point. Dystopia is not something theoretical, but it's a kind of real reality. And so I think that the thing that creates the dystopia is the utopias, maybe. And this westernization uh, thing as a utopic uh, approach is uh, it be, has been led by the Ottoman di uh, dynasty and Stabat shown and uh, with the third cell uh, third Selim is telling that the still the Ottomans are trying to renovate themselves according to their own tra tra tradition and for example in that period they uh, they uh, wanted to create new macams, uh, so new modes of music. So this is, the, this is their approach. So they are all the time inside a tradition. They want to modernize themselves, but they uh, want to stay in the tradition. And but with the second Mahmud, uh, there has been a radical innovation. They have removed the Janizaris, and they have created new uh, music groups, but and that uh, and it there was that was a uh, really radical approach, and also this is an example of uh, utopic approach that will also lead lead, lead to the rep republican uh, step, and also uh, of course we need to mention the Jumlet Halk party uh, here that this uh, utopia approach is a standard thing no it is not a standard thing and our professor Tariq Zafar uh, Tunaya he had a very important study on these groups and he tells over there there are alternative groups they want to modernize uh, but their methods and uh, their roads are different but and they are in competition on political area and he defines five different uh, basic groups there are the westerners uh, and then there are the ottoman uh, ottoman uh, Ottom and the uh, turkish the turks ottomans and with the a group based on british protestant approach and i can say very clearly that that these five groups are still in struggle of political power. So you can see very clearly uh, that there is this kind of struggle on political arena. And with the creation of the Republic, uh, two groups were very, uh, were very e effective. The, the Westerners and the ones that are building their theories on, uh, on Turks, so Turkists. We can call them Turkists. So, also being Westerners, to be, it was meant to be civilized. So, how the music of this utopia will be? So, it will be international music, the harmony, orchest orchestration, composition of this international music. And the second component is the public that will be created against Ottomans. So they want to create a people, a group of people which is against Ottomans. But uh, so they define the, uh, the public as worker group. And there are not, uh, there are no people which is intellectual among them. And if we have a diagram on that, on this dystopia and utopia formation, so on the one hand, there's one thing that has to be uh, left. So, but especially the elitist group, they want to abandon certain things. They want to transform themselves and 
they uh, and they find their previous music as something negative something which is ill and we need to get rid of that and so with uh, so and we need to harmonize and we create an utopia music just like the, in the western world just operas uh, and uh, other sonatas etc etc but putting inside a national touch and Zia Gökalp in in a in a magazine in 1922 he wrote down like this if we look to our country with the with the eyes with the eyes of an artist so if we look only to the to the among the intellectuals ottoman intellectuals we can uh, we cannot see anything and he, he says that the people are essential, essential, and you can find you can find uh, anything between the pe pe in people. So our nation has uh, carries the genius, and so they have a certain direction and uh, some of their expressions are very important so the intellectuals in air europe for example he says so we can understand uh, how they are so national and our intellectual our intellectual group is not so national he says and he's talking then about the people and so in 1913 there was a magazine called Halka Doru towards the people. The Agrikalp tells like this, it's very important. So the intellectual people, they have the civilization, and but the people has uh, uh, only the culture, but the Cup is an imperialist person with the with the worst of an imperialist approach. So you can go over there. So you take some uh, some things from them and you give them uh, culture and civilization. So I will not able to get into this because I'm out of time. So. There are things that they are written by Najib Asim, by Ahmed, uh, and so they are so very imperfect texts, and so many different uh, areas on music literature, and I have written for the first time in my, in my uh, publication, Muiz Cohen. Moïse Cohen, uh, and he's the pioneer of the Zionist movement in Itat Teraki. And in 1936, he wrote down a book called Kemalism, and his expressions over there, so he, he are very important. Those expressions are very important for this theory of dystopia and utopia. But as a result, uh, you can see this table so if you try to understand the process only by the names given to the musical uh, terminology we can easily understand we can easily understand the situation so uh, they are they are uh, called with some names, the, the, the music of the Ottoman time, uh, are positioned in a negative way uh, with some, uh, some words which are, which, is, which are despising those. Uh, and, and the Western musics are called as the real music and international music. And thanks for your attention.
I need the laptop. Ah, we may change place, okay. Between lost homeland and orientalism, Ottoman cities in 20th century Greek popular song. Okay, now. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers of this evening for calling me and giving me the opportunity to talk to you. I hope it will be of interest for you. This lecture is about Ottoman cities in modern Greek popular songs. In particular, it examines patterns of representation and imagination of these cities in popular song lyrics and how these patterns changed in the course of the 20th century. I would like to clarify in advance that this is not about traditional folk song, a genre that has been for at last 200 years now subject of extensive philological, historical, and also ethnolog ethnological research, but unfortunately often based and uh, researched by nationalist or essentialist projections. projections. What I am interested in here are exclusively commercial recordings whose value as historical source is exactly due to the fact that they weren't produced and reproduced for scholarly and or programmatic purposes, but essentially for economic profit. Since they aimed at broader audiences, they can give reliable information, at least more reliable than academic uh, anthologies, about the perceptions of their contemporary public that were reflected on the one hand, but also shaped by popular song lyrics. Geographically, the focus is definitely on Izmir and Istanbul because for them, those cities, we have by far the largest source material in Greek popular song, of course, something that documents the prominent position of these two cities as the two most important centers for Greek urban culture for centuries. Already in the first Greek recordings from the beginning of the 20th century, there are numerous songs about Izmir and Istanbul whose lyrics usually express close emotional attachment of the singer who is perceived to be an inhabitant uh, with his home city. Close emotional attachment. Such is our first example, the song Memory of Smyrna. Now, ah, okay, well, PowerPoint, oops. Oops, sorry. Uh, 19, 1906, first recording by Timotheus Xanthopoulos. It was obviously, this song was obviously a commercial success, as in the following 10 years it saw no less than five further recordings. The melody of this song is clearly Western styled and possibly based on a contemporary French chanson melody, which, however, I wasn't able to identify until now. The lyrics are as follows, you see it on the PowerPoint, and of course I apologize for the shortcomings of the <laughs> English translation. Uh, let, us, let us concentrate on the uh, second uh, verse, the most beautiful uh, memory, the greatest of all, the one that emerges invigorating is the coastline of Smyrna. And then follows, it follows Smyrna, my sweet homeland, graceful city, I will never forsake you. Uh, now, um, the dominant motive, of course, here, indicated already by the title, uh, is nostalgic remembrance from spatial, not temporal distance. With the city functioning as reference point also of identity, but also for orientation in the foreign, as it is expressed by the metaphor of the shining star in some way. The mention of the seashore of Smyrna as optical landmark corresponds to 
correspondence to temporary, uh, contemporary visual media as photographs and postcards, as you see in the lower section. Similar articulations of emotional attachment are also found in songs about Istanbul. But the musical structures, which I can't discuss here, of course, are usually less Western styled than those of the songs about Izmir. Our next example is a song, first time recorded in 1928 under the title uh, Susta Politiki. Mm. Uh, Susta is a dance, it's a dance. Uh, uh, Susta from Istanbul, sung by the famous singer Andonis Diamandidis, whose artist name was also Dalgas. It is a so-called amanes, a vocal solo based on a rhymed couplet, as you see here. Uh, the city and the Bosporus are my dream, there lives my love, there my torment, or tormentor. I guess. The word dream here is not meant here in the sense of a fantastic vision, but ex as expression of veneration. However, the semblance of trivial sentimentality is avoided here due to the coupling of the nouns love and torment that gives the emotional attachment with the city, Istanbul, uh, deepness and some plausibility, I would say. Another example for strong identification with Istanbul and especially its most significant, significant landmark, the Hagia Sophia, is to be found in the homonymous song Hagia Sophia that is a true evergreen, one can say, of popular, Greek popular music with nearly countless uh, commercial recordings until today. The oldest recording documented uh, until now is uh, from 1925 and performed by Maria Papagica, one of the great female voices of this genre, uh, who in those years had a career in the United States. The lyrics of this first recorded version are as follows, you see them in the PowerPoint, but uh, it should be noted that many additional verses and text variants are also known because the song originally belongs to the anonymous tradition of urban folk song. So we see here, like the marbles of the city that are in the Hagia Sophia, such like are shaped or arranged, I'm not so sure, your eyes, eyebrows, and hair. And then I decided to become a dome in Hagia Sophia so that Turkish and Rum girls may come to worship. Now, <laughs> why are you laughing? <laughs> uh, the second verse is remarkable, of course, with regard to the fantastic scenario it describes. This is not only the metamorphosis of the singer into an architectural component, <laughs> but also the awaited worship. With, clear, uh, with the word worship uh, having a clearly religious connotation, proskinesi. Eh? So we have to imagine Muslim and Christian girls worshiping together in a building that was erected, as commonly known once, at ch as church, but at this time it was a mosque. This, however, is obviously not perceived as a logical contradiction. So the first, despite of its fantastic character, rather reflects intercommunal life as everyday phenomenon, giving simultaneously a hint on the significance of the Hagia Sophia that stays here as symbol for absolute aesthetic harmony, but also as reference point of a shared identity of Muslims and Christians of Istanbul. In this context, it should be noted that in these so song lyrics, as in the previous example, there isn't any expression of distance, be it spatial or temporal, far away from being a remembrance. The city, Istanbul, functioned as the real, the natural living space of the singer, something very common in popular songs uh, of this genre at the beginning of this 20th century, of course, 
And this perspective is also true for the first song I mentioned here, as it implies only a limited absence of the singer from Izmir. Spatial distance limited, not temporal. In this regard, they reflect a normality, we can say, however, a normality that was going to change radically, as it's commonly known, since uh, the First World War, and especially after the defeat of Greece in Asia Minor in, in 1922 and the following uh, expulsion and population exchange. Now, normally we should assume that such a dramatic, drastic, tra and traumatic incident would have found adequate reflection in contemporary post-1922, I mean, popular so songs, even more in view of the fact that the music industry that began to emerge in Greece since the 1920s was absolutely dominated then by musicians from Asia Minor and especially from Izmir and Istanbul, many of them being refugees themselves. So we could await a reflection, but this was not the case. Actually, there's no explicit mention of the events of uh, 1922 in Greek song lyrics in the whole interwar period, and even implicit references to the expulsion and loss of homeland are relatively scarce. Thank you. On example, one example is the song, uh, indirect uh, uh, reference, is the song What Do You Care? that so numerous recordings uh, until today again. The first of them is in 1926, again by Maria Papangika. Tise Meliesena, what do you care? What do you care from where I am, from Karatash, my love, or from Cordelio? What do you care? And I'll always ask me from which village I am, since you don't love me. It's the refrain. In the place from where I am, they know to laugh, know to hide their sorrow, know to enjoy. In the last verse, I come, come from Smyrna to find consolation, to find in our Athens love and embrace. So it's also an evergreen of Greek popular music in the 20th century until today. Now, the outskirts of Karatash and Cordelio, today Karsiaka or Perea in Greek, uh, mentioned the two outskirts in the first verse stand in this specif specific context, in the spe context of pre-war Izmir, primarily as markers for ethno-religious communities as Karataj was inhabited predominantly by Sephardic Jews and Cordelio by Orthodox Greeks. Secondly, it can also be understood as a social marker given that Cordelio was definitely a very rich neighborhood. So the alluded plot here is a love relationship between members of different ethno-religious and or social status. The latter being a very widespread motif, of course, in popular liter literature, not only in Greece, but all over the world. This Izmir-specific indicator, Jews, Christians, poor, rich, comprehensible actually only for local insiders, is replaced, however, in the third verse by a horizontal, horizontal one, that is Izmir and Athens, with the latter Athens being provided also with a national emphasis by the term our, totally unusual, in this lyrics, our Athens, something that indicates that the Greek capital is now the common homeland for the local population as for the refugee newcomers from Asia Minor. So we can assume, and personally I'm convinced about it, that this third verse is a later addition to a pre-existing song text, a addition made in order to reflect the new reality after 1922. And such additions or modifications of lyrics can be observed in many urban folk songs, of the, also of the anonymous tradition, as is the case, for example, with Bergama. I don't have a PowerPoint uh, for you. Bergama, likewise, a very famous song that saw many, many recordings, 
some of them also with Turkish, uh, mixed Turkish and Greek lyrics. Here again, the original motive, at least in the Greek version, <coughs> is actually an articulation of erotic desire from a woman in Bergama and sequentially also for a woman in Izmir, Forta, Chios, and elsewhere. But the song took a different meaning by addition of the following verse, Bergame, oh my nice Bergame, we left and cried for you. We cried for our love and the sea became murky by our tears. It's remarkable, however, that this verse, I quote it now, is documented first time in a recording of 1972, that is half a century after the expulsion of the Asia Minor Greeks. And it took place, of course, in this totally different social political context. But before examining this, let us stay a little more in the interwar period. As already mentioned, there are relatively scarce references to the 1922 events in popular song lyrics of this period, although the vast majority of established music producers came from a refugee background then. This may be interpreted, interpreted to some degree as deliberate silence in reaction to the traumatic experiences, but may be also have been an attempt not to impede the refugees' integration into Greek society, a task that was far away from being uh, completed then. So since the beginning of the 1930s, we have a growing number of song lyrics dealing with the presence of refugees and their interaction with the local Greek society. And in this context, Ottoman cities, first again, Izmir and Istanbul, appear as place of origin of the protagonists uh, of the songs, mostly female, by the way, but simultaneously as stereotyped projections for pers personal character traits. Main features of such projections are, apart from typical descriptions of physical beauty, dark eyes, slim body, and so on, uh, occasionally combined with outstanding dancing abilities with a clear specialization of Izmir for Zeybekikos <laughs> and Istanbul for Hasapikos. Um, apart from this, this character trait is the stereotype projection is the ascription of urban elegance and cleverness um, together with emancipated attitudes, and not the least, uh, also liberated sexual behavior. So the Tatavliani Tsakhpina, the tasteful girl from Tatavla, or the Mortisa Smirnya, tough woman from Izmir, are almost classical cliche, cliches of this kind. A predominant pattern of these songs is, of course, the encounter between refugee woman and indigenous man. This is true also for our next example, the song Refugee Girl, Prosfigopulla, recorded in 1936 by Panayotis Tundas, at this time the most influential music producer in Greece. This song doesn't seem to have had great success, commercial success, but it's interesting for its lyrics. So we see here, don't break my heart with your lament, don't do that because I'm suffering together with you. You're burning my heart with your sweep. Uh, I preferred this translation, pronunciation, dialect. Refugee girl, when you're telling your pain, laugh, my refugee girl, forget the disaster. One time we will return to our old neighborhood. In our nice Smyrna, we'll build a little place and live with our love and kisses. Um, it's this central theme, it's, it's this, this, the third part, the refrain. This is a very rare case, actually the only one I was able to localize until now, that the possibility of return of refugees is articulated in a 
Greek popular song, but we have to take into account that in the 1930s, when the song was produced, this was indeed still considered as tangible perspective by many refugees from Asia Minor. The text is remarkable, however, also in another aspect. By leaving uncertain whether the singer is an indigenous Greek or a refugee himself, look at the first verse, I uh, suffering together with you, it's not so clear. Compare the first and the second uh, verse. It defines the fate of the refugees as part of the fate of the Greek people as a whole, and accordingly, it places Izmir as lost homeland for every Greek, regardless of his actual origin, whether he is from there or he is not. And in this way, the refugees are symbolically integrated in the Greek society, while their homeland, Smyrna, becomes part of something I would call, uh, characterize a Greek memorial geography. This motif was to become dominant uh, in Greek uh, after uh, Greek popular songs uh, some decades later, many years later, but in the interwar period it was by no means self-evident still. Here we have numerous songs in the interwar period in contrast to the examples shown until now that don't reflect any real places and experience but refer to Ottoman cities merely as spaces of exotic and erotic uh, imagination without any serial historical reference. <coughs> and this is especially true for song lyrics of the rebetico genre, which in contrast to a widespread though mistaken assumption was not imported by Asia Minor refugees in 1922, but originated in Greece in the 19th century and only later became into contact with the music brought from east of the Aegean. In these early rebetica, rebetico songs, which made appearance in Greek commercial, uh, commercial uh, recordings since 1933, actually, apart from some scattered recordings in the US since uh, 1928, we find articulations of something I would characterize as kind of Greek or rather Hellenic Orientalism. A striking example is the song in the Hammam of Istanbul, written and sung by Anestis Delias, member of the famous Periodic Tetras in 1935. They were the stars of, of the song in these years. And so you can see here um, in the Hammam of Istanbul, a harem is bathing, Negroes, uh, sorry, but <laughs> it's, it's the song, <laughs> guard it and bring it to Ali Pasha. He sends his guard to bring them before him in order them to dance and to play buzuki for him. He wants to smoke nargile with Turkish hashish and the harem ladies to, to dance gypsy chifteteli for him. This is how all pashas in the world are spending their time with nargiles, with smoking pipes, with embraces and kisses. This song was reproduced many, many times in the following decades, so today it counts to the classics, one can say, of Greek popular, urban popular music. Of course, without reference, references to hashish smoking, which were neatly censored in later recordings, of course. What is interesting here for us, however, is the remarkable absence of any real historical context. The mention of Ali Pasha in the first first refers to Ali Pasha of Janina, of course, who indeed is a historical person known by every school child in 20th century Greece, but who probably <laughs> never had been in Istanbul, at least not alive and in one piece. Um, his head was taken after his defeat in Yanya in 1822. Okay, by the way. Likewise, the scenery of harem ladies bathing, playing music, and dancing for pleasure of their masters reflects nothing else than common cliches that can be found already in the first West European travelogues of the 16th century, largely, of course, as production of imagination. 
Hashish smoking in connection with Ottoman settings is also a common motive in early Rebetiko song lyrics, where apart from Istanbul and Izmir, also cities like Aydin or Bursa figure mainly as supply sources for high quality drugs. This is rather also a to, to be considered an orientalizing cliché, although it can't be excluded, uh, probably pff, that in some cases it had some real background, but I'm not sure about this. Generally, we can observe that projections of oriental exoticism became fashionable in Greek popular song lyrics, especially in the period from 1946 until 1953, when they formed even an own subgenre, the so-called Oriental, that was populated by fabulous women with sounding names like Yul Bahar, Jemile, Aisha, Semiha, Halima, Sehrasat, Habiba, Zaira, uh, just to name some of them. Our next example belongs to this genre, Oriental, although it its original roots seems to have been an Armenian review song of the last 19th century. It was uh, recorded in 1948 by Apostolos Hadzi Christos under the title Kaixis, Kaixi, and you see it here, um, Gel Gel Kaixi, Yavas Yavas, at the coast of Istanbul, in the silence, in the lake of the harem, Gail Gail Kaichi, I want to abduct the gazelle Hanum, enslaved in her cell. She's crying and mourning, and she desires her freedom, Gail Gail Kaichi. As in the previous example, Istanbul is free of contexts, historical contexts, and functions rather as stage for a plot that is obviously a variation of the abduction from the Serayo motif. The Turkish text passages are of special interest because here they are not really a manifestation of bilingualism, as is the case in several older songs like Karabiberim or the aforementioned Bergama, but rather serve to emphasize the oriental flair of the scenery, something that is indicated also by the metrical position, by the way. Such projections of Istanbul as place of exotic beauty can be observed also in other Greek music productions of this period, for example, the song Yildiz, Full Moon on the Bosporus. Yildiz uh, Panselinos Slovosporo, recorded in the same year as the Kaixis by Sula Kalfopoulou. It describes a nocturnal boat trip on the Bosporus that includes encounters with sultanas uh, of exotic loveliness and dark eyes and concludes in a last verse, uh, full moon and Istanbul smiles, silver rays are fa falling on palaces and mosques, and you believe that it is a dream you can't find anywhere else. There's so many beauties of Yildiz. Uh, it is remarkable in this verse that even the appellation city, poli, otherwise common, in pra common practice in Greek uh, popular things for Istanbul, is dropped in this Yildiz song in favor for Istanbul, not Istanbul, Istanbul, presumably in order, again, to underscore the exotic setting and thus to avoid identifications with the real poly, the, with uh, the real city. The great popularity of this oriental genre in the, uh, in the projection it transported which in their design show strong references, I think, to contemporary Hollywood film productions. And, uh, this uh, popularity in the late 40s and early 50s is it's impressive and may possibly be interpreted to some degree as manifestation of escapism, maybe in reaction to the harsh realities of Greek societies uh, in, in the civil war years and the post-war, first years of the post-war period. It is remarkable, however, that Istanbul, where 
a Greek community existed and was vivid at least until 1955, uh, that this city in Greek popular song lyrics since the middle of the 20th century became more and more a place of exotic imagination, while Izmir, where the Greek presence was actually wiped out in 1922, was more and more integrated in, ge in the geographical space of Greek national memory. A major turning point in this development can be located in 1972, when a, an LP was published under the title Mikra Asia Asia Minor that turned out very, very successful and simultaneously uh, it was uh, the career breakthrough of Yorgos Dalaras and Haris Alexiou, who until today count to the most eminent interpreters of Greek popular music. This LP includes 13 songs, all of them with thematic reference to Asia Minor, for example, the Straits of Bosporus, two guys from Ivali, Cordelion is burning, but the most known title and also the figurehead of this uh, LP is without any question the song Smyrna. Uh, you see the lyrics here. Smyrna mother is burning, our belongings are burning, our pain is unspeakable, our grief is unwritable. Hellenism, Hellenism, okay, Hellenism is, is, is a little bit difficult, it's a Romeo scene, okay, I will refer later to this. You won't come to rest, one year you live in peace and 30 years in fire. Yes, should I stop now? Yes, okay, it's in, it's in range, <laughs> okay. Uh, Smyrna mother and so on. Lo now, um, in stark contrast to song lyrics of the interwar period, where the explosion, as I mentioned, of 1922 uh, was referred at most indirectly, here it appears in the center of a dramatic narrative that culminates in an almost macabre description at the end. It refers to the flight of thousands of Greeks and so on, um, and this becomes obvious really, that this as historical event then was firmly established in collective memory, that the, in the last verse, the description is barely comprehensible without having in mind the photographs of this flight. Um, and it is uh, clear that this song was written in considerable temporal distance to the events. Um, and this is a, a very important aspect um, because um, we have a situation, social political situation, in, uh, totally different uh, from the interwar period. And consequently, the meaning of this song and of the whole LP is to be inquired much more in uh, its own time than in the past it uh, refers to. We have to consider that in 1972 Greece, we had a military dictatorship of extreme right-wing officers with a strongly anti-communist and nationalist agenda. According to their ideology, the roots of authentic Hellenism were located in the rural space. Therefore, they presented folk music, especially from mainland Greece, as in, in, in an abusive manner, I would say as alleged expression of uh, authenticity of the nation, while on the other hand, they disapproved urban popular music, uh, especially such of oriental shape as product of cultural distortion and uh, inferiority. This was actually nothing new. Uh, the kernels of, uh, 90, of the dictatorship uh, actually only repeated the same policy implemented already in the, by the Metaxas dictatorship in the 1930s, 1936. And against this background, the theming of Asia Minor in the LP was, by, was not nationalist uh, or revanchist as we could think at first glance, but in contrary, a deliberate de recourse to a musical and cultural heritage that um, was in opposition to the right-wing nationalist culture propagated by the regime. 
And so it's hardly by chance that it was in the same time that also the, the discovery of the officially ostracized Rebetico began. So we have here actually a anti-right-wing nationalist uh, approach, if you want, uh, with reference to the um, past, and especially to Smyrna. So I have expended my time, I think, so I thank you for your attention. Uh, for any questions, I am at your service. Thank you very much. I hope What kind of musical instruments were they using? Was it a fixed set of instruments or have they changed by time? Yeah. Yes, they changed. Uh, in the early recordings, especially from Izmir, we have in the Western style, we have piano, we have violoncello, we have uh, also mandolines, okay? Uh, in the more oriental setting, like the Susta from Istanbul and so on, uh, we have... Uh, Sometimes accordion, but usually we have um, politiki lira. What is lira? Um, it's a string instrument. Uh, we have kemenje, uh, kemenje. <laughs> okay, uh, we have um, we have sometimes oud, chimbush, something like that. In mainland Greek rebetiko, there is one dominant instrument. It's buzuki, a totally unknown. In Istanbul and in Izmir, in, 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 in the east, uh, in, in, in the west coast of Asia Minor, it, it, it's a Hellenic hybrid instrument between what is called in the 19th century tambura. It's not tambur, in Turkey, also but yes, but it's had nothing to do with the Greek buzuki. Because it has a temperated scale, temperated scale. Okay, and we have now in the 1930s we have a great career of the buzuki with, that became in the post war period the figurehead of Greek music, something totally incomprehensible in the interwar period because it was disapproved by official culture. So we have a change, of course, uh, and in the 1970s and on. Okay, here we have uh, electric guitar guitars, drums, and so on, yeah. It's, okay. yeah. Okay. <laughs> yes. So just to get an impression of uh, the sound okay. of... Uh, yeah. Uh, then, uh, I, I, I have. Uh, I didn't take. You can see it, but I have no accompany. Yes. Okay. Πανσέλινος και στουβο σπόρου τα νερά, καθώς η βάρκα κύλα στο κύμα παλά, τα μαγιά του ουρανού μου φέρνουν στο νου τα τόσα καλή του γυλτής. Σουλτάνες με κορμιά σαν τα κρίνα και με εξωτική ομορφιά. Σουλτάνες μάτια σαν τη ζωγραφιά. Τραβά βαρκάρι και παίρνα πάλι αγάλι αγάλι μπροστά απ' το γυλτής. Τραβά βαρκάρι και παίρνα πάλι 
Αγαλιά γάλι μπροστά από το ωραίο γυλτή. Ακαπέλα, μου καταλαβαίνω. Uh, <laughs> if I knew that I, I had brought my bouzouki. <laughs> if I knew that I can't feel my mouth. <laughs> 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 yes. Really. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions? Please uh, use the chance. Otherwise, I would like to thank our speakers and thank the audience for coming and hope to see you.